Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. So. How close does it come? How close does the image come to the man? It's, 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 it's very hard to live up to an image. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Compared to what they do now. Are you kidding? I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. We just jiggle, you know. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I I really can't criticize anybody. I, you know, in the entertainment field, I I think there's room for everybody, and I I, I hate to criticize another performer. You know, I take vitamin E. Uh, <laughs> I was only kidding. I don't know. I just embarrass myself, man. Uh, I I don't know, dear. I just. I enjoy the business. I like what I'm doing. Come on over, baby. Oh, I'm singing on and on. You do it all I can. Come on over, baby. I'm a big deal. I'm a big deal. Hey, baby. Oh, I'm singing on and on. Rock and roll has got to go. And go it does at KWK. We're all through playing rock and roll records. This week is record-breaking week here at KWK. And after this week, no more rock and roll will be played on the air. Why do you say? Well, it's a very simple reason. Seventeen years ago, a system was formed here at KWK, a policy of polling the record shops to decide which records were the most sold, therefore which ones should be played the most on the air. Seventeen years ago, the system was great. Ten years ago, even five years ago, it was a good system. But in the past few months, we've begun to believe that it's becoming antiquated. And so, no more pulling the record shots, no more rock and roll. Now, at the risk of being immodest, that's all right with me also. But I truly believe, it's not necessarily from a genius on my part, that geographically that it's good, from the delta of Arkansas, for the black man and the white man, and there's just something that goes along with a river, like the mighty, muddy Mississippi. I think possibly it could have happened in practically anywhere, but I do think the natural place for it to have happened is in the South, and most especially where Handy wrote the blues, Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee, USA. <laughs> I call myself a rock and roll singer, rock and roll country singer, rock and roll country and western rhythm and blues singer, a stylist, like Al Jolson, the late Jimmy Rogers, and the late great Hank Williams. Come on, baby, you know we got chicken in the morning, come on, what's the morning, come on. Big man got the bull by the horn. Thinking there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Easy now. Shake it, baby. Now don't you break it, wrap it up, and I'll take it. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. I like it. That's right. You know what I mean. And I'm looking at every good looking thing in America right now. Meat man. You know what I am. Woo! Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, baby. Shake it, don't you break it, wrap it up, and I'll take it. I gotta have it. I can't do without it. I never could. Let the jammer do it, and it's good, 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 good. Wow! Shake it, baby. Ooh, get my man, baby. Oh, baby. I don't know. Shake it, Everyone knew that I was just a little struggling cat down here trying to develop new and hopefully different artists and get some freedom in music and tap some resources and people that uh, weren't being tapped by the establishment, so to speak.
lot of the guys that are from my part of the country started off professionally with Sam, Johnny Cash, and of course Elvis Presley, and Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, there's so many of them. Home alone, I hang my head in sorrow. All of us played the same little old clubs within a 300 mile radius of Memphis, around the uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Missouri area. Take this chain from my heart and set me free. I was doing country music, strictly country. Bluegrass almost. Sam Phillips was trying to pull all these people into a certain thing that he wanted to hear. It was a mixture between Negro spiritual, Negro blues, and country music. And everybody that walked in the studio, no matter what style of music you sang, he'd push you in a certain direction. Of course, looking back, nobody really picked it up and did the things to it that had to be done that Sam Phillips did uh, to make it come alive and grow. But uh, the very first record Elvis cut, that type of thing was all around us. Of course, I asked him first the type of thing that he thought that he did, and he told me that he sang religious songs he had written mainly himself. And I love those good country religious songs, and I do to this day. But I said, there's no way I can't sing it. Anyway, I found a song written by a white gentleman, and it was called Without Love. I brought it back and decided that I would call Elvis and have him come by and go over the song, see if he liked it and, and, and this sort of thing. Anyway, he came on over. He lived over here on Alabama Street, which is about a mile from where we're sitting now. I had my secretary call him. Before she hung up the phone, he was in the studio. And I wondered how he got over there so fast, even in an automobile. So I asked Elvis, I said, uh, how did you get over here? He said, uh, Mr. Phillips... I ran. So I called up Scotty Moore, Bill Black, told him how to get a hold of Elvis, work him out on anything they could, and let's listen and see what we could come up with. Well, this procedure went on for six months before I was about ready to give up. So I said, Elvis, don't you have a suggestion what we could do to just get something that has total abandon? I don't care what it is, what category of music or anything it fits in. So he thought a little bit. He said, Mr. Phillips, do you remember that old song by Arthur Big Boy Crudup? The tune was, That's All Right, Mama. I think we did two takes on it, and I said, Good Lord, why in the hell didn't you make this suggestion sometime? He said, It just came to me. I said, you've got to have one more, Elvis, that you know. This is too good. We've got to have a backside of this record. <laughs> then he cut out on this old Blue Moon of Kentucky written by Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. And I said, I don't believe this. This meshing of real black man song and a real country song uh, back to back. I said, I'm going to put these things out back to back. Blue Moon. Blue Moon. We put that record out, and believe me, we got from ridiculous comments to more ridiculous comments. Some of my best friends that had played R&B records for me, they would say, well, look, Sam, this guy is so country sounding that he shouldn't sing after the sun comes up in the morning. He's country, rooster crow. Then T. Tommy Couture, who's now WSM in Nashville, one of the big uh, country music stations, Grand Ole Opry station. And I said, well, T. Tommy, can you not play Blue Moon of Kentucky for me? He listened to it. He said, Sam, if I do, says, my listeners will call me and run me out of town. On a day like today, we pass the time away. 
So I came in, and uh, Bill met me at the airport and said, there's a new fellow that's going to be on the show with you tonight. He's going to be a very big star. And I said, oh, really? Anybody I heard of? He says, I doubt it. His name's Elvis Presley. Well, I had heard of Elvis Presley because I'd uh, lived and been, in, been at school in Texas, and I'd seen the name on some country jukeboxes, so I knew he had to be a hillbilly singer, so how could he ever be a big star? And even the name, Elvis Presley... Uh, I sort of smiled at myself, you know, he could never be a big star. I was there first and backstage waiting, and in came Elvis with his hair slick and greasy and coat that seemed a little too big for him, sort of hanging off his shoulder. Of course, that's the way he was doing it in those days, and his collar turned up, his pants three or four inches too long, just sort of bagging down around his shoes, and, and he came in with about four or five guys, a couple big fat guys and a couple little fellas, and... and um, and he, and he sort of seemed to want to stand behind them. So in a minute, I went over and shook hands with him, said, Hi, Elvis, I'm Pat Boone. And, and uh, he says, Mama Zebra Harvest. And I didn't understand what he was saying. He was very, because he, he, he was very shy. He really seemed to be uncomfortable having to talk to anybody. And uh, I said, Bill Randall tells me you're going to be a big star. Said, well, my son, Barbara Simon. And uh, I couldn't understand what that was either, so I just, I, I, there was not much to talk about. I could tell he was, um, he really just wanted to get on, do his few songs and get out of there. He was just very uncertain of the whole thing. So uh, he did go on first, and uh, Bill gave him a big introduction. But then when he started singing and sort of really getting into it, well, they got excited, and I was glad that I had a big hit record going for me because I had to follow him. So the word got around that Presley was for sale. Believe me, no one had contacted me about buying Presley's contract or anything else I had to sell. If, in fact, I had anything to sell. Except my record. But it became known to me that Tom Parker was spreading a rumor. Well, this was not good. After four years of work, doing everything or attempting to do everything that's known to the business. So I called up Parker. He said, no, I am certainly not guilty or any of my people in the organization. I said, well, Tom, I certainly appreciate the fact that you're so candid with me. And I hope you are right. So he said, just before we hung up, he said, by the way, would you be interested in selling Elvis's contract? <laughs> well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lonely Street, that's all we can do. All we can see, all we can see, all we can see, all we can see, all we can see. He told me, he said, Carl, I don't have room for two guys singing this same type of thing. But he sold Elvis to RCA Victor. Then he told me, he said, get you a song, man. Well, there's one for the money, two for the show. Three to get ready now. Well, must have been about a week after that, I was playing some shows with Johnny Cash. John said to me one night in Parkin, Arkansas, he said, Carl, why don't you write your song about blue suede shoes? John, I don't know nothing about blue suede shoes. What about them? He said, well, the guys in the Army get dressed up. I'm standing in the chow line, somebody will say, don't step on my blue suede. But it really didn't stir up anything until about two weeks after that, I was playing in Jackson, and I heard it the second time. There was a boy and girl dancing right in front of the bandstand, and she stepped on his shoe. And he said, hey, don't step on my suede. And he was serious. You can do anything when they all have a loose with each shoe. There wasn't a name for what we did. Pardon me, we, uh, I, I just call it music with a beat. It got 
tagged rock and roll somewhere about the 50s. Uh, uh, after Blue Suede Shoes uh, came out, uh, somebody somewhere said, that's rock and roll music. And I remember I said, well, that's, that's what I'm playing. If it's rock and roll, I've always done it. You ain't nothing but a hand dog. a brand new young generation that had not been in any sense participants in the war had not felt any of the idealism of bringing about a millennium and peace on earth and finally destroying the forces of evil they were disillusioned politically and in every possible way I mean, the atmosphere of the time cold war they could do nothing about it an atom bomb hanging over their head so that they went sour on everything and they just rejected everything to do with their forebears and uh, they wanted a music that would express this they didn't know they wanted it it wasn't conscious but they needed something that expressed uh, their feelings of that they were going to live for that precise second and no longer come down here from from New York and from Florida to to find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it and I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today I 100% believe it. why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it I know what it does to you and I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it The sensuality of the South, all this was reflected obviously in music that came from that area. What was called race music, rhythm and blues, black music, but had not been generally heard.
Since the days of the founding fathers, many of America's great cultural achievements have traveled across the seas to bring joy and enlightenment abroad. The twist is our latest contribution. From Copenhagen to Milan, all Europe is gyrating to the beat of the latest from the crazy Americans. And they love it. All of them. has spilled over from the dance floors to the very seat of business. The dance takes a certain kind of special delivery. Uh, asked me how long I gave it, and uh, I could see no end to it. And uh, he he gave it three he gave it three months. Uh, I think think it was three months. Might have been two. And then I met him six years later, and uh, it was at the uh, Beatles' first concert. And I walked up to him at the Carnegie Hall and said, "Well, now how long do you give it?" And he reg regretted that he now believed me and that uh, he could see no end to it. He was very sad about that. Dead now. It lasted longer than he did. Hey, Roger. Hey. We just simply on down to the toll gate to drive a shout back down the line. rock and roll with a passion because I think basically Donegan was a bit of a musical snob and rock to him was trash and had no pedigree. And the idea was that uh, the impoverished neighbours would get together hold a party and have a whoop up and a few jugs of homemade wine and, and play some bits and pieces with the broom and the guitar, whatever was handy. Sing a uh, whoop up, you know, sort of Negro version of Knees Up Mother Brown. And take pass a hat round 
for whoever's turn it was to pay the rent. So uh, that's how the, it's going to be a rent house party or skiffle party and skiffle music, which was the type of free-for-all music they would play at such a thing. And that's the word we took because we weren't playing pure folk music, obviously. Not being Negroes from the Delta, you know. I mean, East Ham High Street, long way, isn't it? You know what I mean? Skiffle was very important to rock because it happened almost simultaneously, maybe a little bit before rock really broke loose. Donegan called it traditional American music because he wanted a pedigree, but actually he invented it because it was, after all, originally played on washboards and cheap guitars, three chord stuff, four chord at the most, <laughs> and anybody could do it. They couldn't play guitar solos a la Gene Vincent or sax solos a la Bill Haley's band. But as rock began to become more fatally attractive, uh, uh, they they at least had the basis of learning uh, how to play rock. It was very difficult to buy a guitar. Very difficult to buy an acoustic guitar in England at that time. Yes, really. I mean, the guitar trade should really give me a medal. <laughs> and banjos, of course. You had to find one in a second-hand shop somewhere. Hallelujah! started there were no musicians who had any background in anything that would subsequently have anything to do with with rock uh, the British popular music uh, had had been ever since the advent of jazz totally imitative <laughs> Tommy Steele, for instance, and his band was abominable, and he just came on the stage and yelled at the audience, and it was a really revolting display, because it meant nothing, it was totally empty, the music was awful, and it was just an example of how foolish the public were to watch such a thing. For the early English rock stars, the only way they could get exposure was on the British Music Hall because the BBC wouldn't have anything to do with them. And if they were going to make it, they had to do it on the old music hall circuits. And it was in that way, coming in contact with the tradition of British music hall, that they learnt the trade of selling their act visually. That was the difference. In America, they were basically people who appeared in package shows in auditoria and dance halls. And uh, they were doing what had been done for years with touring dance bands and so forth, just coming on and singing. How it broke out was that the BBC decided they would do a program for adolescents. The word teenagers wasn't used in polite society at that time. And since I was the youngest member of the BBC team of producers and had never done anything, and uh, they couldn't think of anything I could adequately do, they decided to unleash me on this program, which would include such items as whether to wear lipstick before six o'clock for young ladies, and how to do mountain climbing for Boy Scouts in only hilly areas. Old six rock joints in London were the coffee bars and it became known that people like myself would go around coffee bars and pick up these rock imitators so that everybody who thought that they could possibly look and sound like Elvis packed into the Two Eyes coffee bar and would strum a guitar and go uh -huh, a blue jean bob uh -huh. and uh, I would be idiot enough to pick up a few of them 
if they were really quite close, as I could see, and put them on the screen, because we had nothing else, and we had to do something. And the new singer making his first appearance on Tip for the Top and on television is Terry Dean. You're going to choose to meet your Jack and Dee. Don't you know the crazy things you do to me? Don't you know that I get dizzy and to touch? A dude just like a fella who has had too much. Why don't you come in? Such was the impact of the first out-and-out -out Elvis imitator Terry Dean that within three weeks of his first appearance on the Six Five Special, he was topping the bill at the Metropolitan, doing colossal business. It was a mad, mad situation. And he was a quiet lad who'd suddenly been rocketed in three weeks to this colossal stardom. And they really cracked him up. He started throwing bricks through lampposts and getting into trouble in the army. And finally, he's become an evangelist in Sweden, I think. Jolly nice fellow. Hey. Well, hello, ain't a lady, and lover, ain't no fool. Young love is rough and tough. And if you want to win, you got to play it real cool. Everybody wanted to look like Elvis and sort of sing like Jerry Lee, I suppose, in a way. Although I wanted to do both sound like both of them because they were both knockout. Uh, the thing I remember about um, Elvis is that until he came along, until he and Bill Haley broke the scene here, uh, my pop world was based around Teresa Brewer, Who's the girl that said, come on in my house, my house, or come on? Uh, Rosemary Clooney. I mean, that was the pop thing. Warms you with flames of desire. And burns you up all day and tears your heart out at night. Harry Webb was a fellow I auditioned looking a bit like Elvis, very convincing, with a band of middle-aged gentlemen, as I remember, backing him up. And Harry Webb turned out to be Cliff Richard. I took the boy aside, but I tried to persuade him to cut off his sideburns because I felt that the comparison with Elvis would be odorous. He was loath to do this. He felt that he would be like Samson with his hair shorn. And after that, uh, a gentleman with a foreign accent turned up and said, well, how do you like my boy? And I said, I think he's great. He's going to make it. And so the gentleman, I think, walked away and signed him up. <laughs> I don't believe he'd seen him before. Minor Queen Elizabeth glided in sedately enough. It was Southampton that was rock and rolling for the arrival of Bill Haley and his comet. Here on a tour of Britain, Bill left for London, and soon that boat train was rocking over the rails in hip time. At Waterloo, the king of rock and roll was welcomed by, well, just dig those happy cats, another square inside. <laughs> yes, the visit of Bill Haley began in grand style. The forthcoming tour will be crazy man crazy. So you cats, keep your enthusiasm in bounds and don't let the squares knock the rock. We in England were unaware of the fact that the Americans knew nothing about presentation. We saw a couple of rock films which made them look as if they were giving a performance that was rather more exciting than it was, so that we built up these images of what the American rock performers were like from their records, which were excellent. The moody, sweaty, beaty sound of Gene Vincent, who sounded like some sort of southern razor boy who would slit you from ear to ear, up and down and continually, without flicking an eyelid and without uh, missing a beat of Bebopalula. This was the image we had of him, so that when we invited him over to the country to appear on our television shows, we were very prepared for trouble. The plane door opened uh, after the long flight from America, and out came this young southern gentleman who was tremendously, uh, excruciatingly shy, who could not look you straight in the face for long, but said all the right things like, I'm mighty proud to be here, sir, and to be in this wonderful country. And I thought to myself, oh dear, this won't do. This isn't the Gene Vincent that we've all built up in our minds. Uh, so we'll have to create an image for him. He was lean. He looked as if he was dying of consumption. And he also limped. He had these irons on. He'd fallen off a motorbike. I got him to, uh, I got him to walk up and down steps while he sang songs with a hunched back and in black from head to foot, and black gloves and a medallion round his neck. And uh, as he would, as he would and try to negotiate these steps singing Blue Jean Bop, I would yell in the background, Limp, you bugger, limp! 
<laughs> but it worked for him. Well, be back blue. She is my She's the woman with the flying feet. She's the one that walks around the store. She's the one that deals a more, more, more well. Be back dude. She's my baby. Be back dude. he was appearing at the Elephant in Castle in one of his first stage performances with his new personality and the audience was packed with young chaps dressed in black from head to foot with medallions around their necks at that period I never wore anything else but a pinstripe suit and they all turned and looked at me as if to say who is this knit and I thought to myself little do you knits know that you've charged yourself about 10 quid getting kitted up like this because of me <laughs> I was amazed when I first came to see television in America in 1959. I thought that everything in America was bigger, better, glossier and so forth, and it was dull as ditch water. They had a smooth young man coming on and uh, introducing records which would then be played whilst uh, callow youths and young ladies would jump around in an aimless, moronic, semi-stupefied condition. And that would be the program liberally interspersed with advertisements for lotions to improve your complexion. This didn't seem to me to add up to entertainment. Just body, no friends. Just body, permanent body with Bobby. Roller, 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 perm. Set your hair on rollers. Occasionally, big thrill, they would get the actual artist to come on who would badly lip-sync his song. Surrounded by hand-clapping adulators, people had to make rock and roll acceptable, tame it, pass it off as cheerful young music that we needn't be afraid of, folks. <laughs> it was an insidious process of turning it into pap. Strings would be added. People would go plink-plink in the background to a rock beat rock stars were given mohair suits and they were expected to wear collars and ties they were interviewed by earnest reporters who asked them what their real ambition was and they would say well I I really want to become an all-round entertainer the words all-round entertainer were the things that bugged me so badly that in the end I just got out why, why, why? Why, why, why? Easy. I want Boogie Man to let me down some old, good, deep, 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 tight, mother humping blue. Easy, boy. Make it, Boogie. Are the cameras rolling, sir? You just would, uh, you would just like me to say. So thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to say, ladies and gentlemen, that it's really a privilege to be in Europe. It's something that I've looked forward to for some time. And uh, it's, uh, 
I consider it a privilege to be assigned to such a fine outfit as the 3rd Armored Division. And I hope that uh, uh, I can live up to everybody's uh, expectations of me, and I will do my very best to. I, I only regret that uh, I, I can't do some, some shows and different things while I'm here, but I will be looking forward when my uh, army hitch is over. I would, uh, I would like very much to come back on a regular tour of Europe. I would like to say that when I get out of the army, I have... Uh... It was like seeing a, a lion taken out of the jungle and put into a cage and tamed. And it all happened when he went into the army. I suppose it was bound to happen. Either Elvis was going to, to break down, and, uh, uh, as Terry Dean did, or he was going to conform. And Elvis had the self-control to conform. But he was never the same. We felt that we'd been abandoned. I think that Elvis Presley, the phony type kid, you know, by letting rock and roll down, I stuck by it. Kept cutting the rock records, even though they wouldn't play them. But yeah, he started trying to sing like Bean Crowd and, and all that stuff, you know. It's really like <laughs> But it was great, but I mean, I love Elvis, don't get me wrong, he's great people. Great talent, I guess one of the best, I don't know. But um, I think he let it down. Uh, hold on, Germany! was the type of man who couldn't be tamed. At 19 years old, he was uh, a king among men and knew it. He looked as if he was six foot two, where I think he's probably only about five feet 11. Uh, he walked with tremendous dignity with a great cigar stuck out of the side of his mouth. And it, on stage, he was a force of nature. Uh, he would just whip hell out of that piano. And the establishment loathed him on sight. The fact that he married a 13-year-old girl and brought her over and there was some talk of her being his cousin. The complete invasion of Lewis's privacy, the only excuse for that sort of thing was that they just felt that he was dangerous. <laughs> fine son by Myra, which we lost, and I have a beautiful daughter by Myra, who is with me now, and, uh, and with her mother, she stayed with me in the summer. But uh, no, I don't regret it, and the criticism didn't mean nothing to me because I knew I had enough talent to overcome it. I've always done what I wanted to do, as long as I felt it was right. <laughs> manager, Cecil Harrison, I guess we have driven and ridden a few million miles. We used to put 150 to 200,000 miles a year on a car, working, trying to make it back.
Phoenix, New Jersey, Sergeant Elvis Presley is mustered out after two years of Army service. The rock and roll idol of millions is back on the scene. Among his greeters, Nancy Sinatra. Elvis is glad as can be to be back and eager to start singing. He's also nearly interested in becoming a serious actor. The Army's loss may be the drama's gain. Who knows? Let your children hear the voice above the With all millions on the drumming, all millions of voices are humming. It ain't a single word you live in. The funk began to go out of his music. And although you could sense that Elvis was going to try to stick to his guns and produce the sounds that he wanted, he was overwhelmed by the background in his battle against the establishment. I'm afraid it was perfectly clear that Elvis lost. $10,000 a night to $250 a night is a pretty big disappointment. But I was man enough to fight my way back. Now it just seems like there's nothing to it. <clears throat> but it took 12 years of my life to fight my way back. Just for the love of a girl. <laughs> and then she walked off. So I wonder was it all really worth it? But that's life, we must accept it as it is. a Christian. I'm Christian-minded, but I'm not living it. Now I regret that I don't. I regret that I haven't, because I know I should have. Finally got it out of me, did you? <laughs> if I want to kick that piano stool back and commence to getting on with it, I will do it. I'm not going to let anything down or anybody that made me what I am. And rock and roll is the greatest music in the world. Rhythm and blues, country rock, or what? To me, it's the greatest. A whole lot of shaking going on. You can't get it by that. You might as well hang it up because you couldn't get it at all. <laughs> ah! I hope this ain't on tape. It ain't it. It is. Well, they wrote another divorce. <laughs> That Jack Benny will never die as long as I live. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else, folks. After taking all things into consideration, observing the situation as it is, I am the greatest rock and roll country and western song in the world. heroes and uh, the publishers were taking over the music publishers became important the bland men 
who live in Tin Pan Alley and Broadway, these clever buggers, took over the scene and made it acceptable and profitable and as dull as ditch water. All you could hear was Bobby this, Bobby, Bobby V, Bobby Denton, Bobby Denton, Bobby Darren, but nothing but Bobby on the radio. Thank God for the Beatles. They showed them a trick. Shot them out like, cut them down like a wheat before the sickle. <laughs> Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. That's the best way I know to get rid of them. Why you say eliminate rock and roll from programming here on KWK? Well, it's a very simple reason. You see, 17 years ago, we evolved a system of pulling the record shots. This system has been copied through the years by radio stations throughout the land. We pull the shots to find out which records they play, they sell the most, and these are the records we play the most the next day on KWK. 17 years ago, it was a great system. Five, ten years ago, it was wonderful. Even up to a year or two ago, but today, it's all over. This system has become antiquated, and so the system with the rock and roll records must go. No more rock and roll on KWK after this week, which is, as you know, record-breaking. Starting next week, certainly we'll play popular records. We wouldn't eliminate them. We'll play Jimmy Rogers, Johnny Mathis, and many more. We'll also include fine album music, everything that's good in the way of music. The new sound on KWK.